So thank you everybody for coming back and thank you the new people who are joining us today. This is a very exciting topic because I hear a lot of misunderstandings, myths, misconceptions. Um, carbohydrates have been the target of you know, several fat diets in the past decade. I'm sure you heard of low carb this, low carb that, ketogenic, paleo. So we are going to hopefully debunk you know, some of the myths out there about carbohydrates and give you the scientific evidence for that so you can make peace with the right carbohydrates. So the objectives today, we're going to define what are carbohydrates, what are the functions of carbohydrates in the body, are all carbohydrates created equal? We're going to answer this question for you. We're gonna have a couple questions that I'm gonna require your participation on what is myth, what is fact about carbohydrates. We are going to also talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly carbohydrates based on scientific evidence. And I'm using these terms more because they are catchy terms. Um, we need to be careful when we call foods good or bad because sometimes it depends on the circumstances. So we're gonna use just in the sense that we are going to show different levels of health benefits and processing of those foods. We're also going to have a recipe discussion and then we're going to have some orientation because before you guys divide into the groups. So what are carbohydrates? Carbohydrates are part of one of the six basic nutrients we need to survive and to thrive. So we can, we need to get them from food from outside the body because the body cannot make them. So those, that's the definition of nutrients. So we have six basic nutrients, vitamins, minerals, water, carbohydrates, proteins, and fat. By the way, I see that some of you are taking notes. I wrote a very extensive article that has all this information that you're gonna have access to. You know, just wanted to make sure you're gonna have this information available. So vitamins and minerals are what we consider micronutrients because we need them in small amounts. And then we have water, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Water is something that we need in a large amount because it constitutes is the largest composition of the body. And then carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are what we call macronutrients because we need them in large amounts, but they also release calories or energy. So they're energy yielding nutrients. And we have here the breakdown of how many calories per gram of all these macronutrients. So each gram of carbohydrate releases four calories. Each gram of protein releases four calories. And each gram of fat releases nine calories. Okay. So just by looking at this, we can already start to debunk some myths about carbohydrates that they are fattening. Because number one, they are between the, those three macronutrients, they are equal with proteins in terms of calories that they release. And of all those three nutrients, fat is the one that is more concentrated in calories. So it's something that we're gonna be talking about throughout this, you know, different parts of the series. But really we need to shift our focus from carbohydrates as causing weight gain and look at processed foods and foods that have a lot of concentrated fat because that's where most of the calories are coming from. In terms of types of carbohydrates, carbohydrates can be found in three forms, in the form of sugar, in the form of starch, or in the form of fiber. Sugar can be you know, the type of sugar you think of when you think of candies, when you think of desserts, but it can also be the type of sugar that is naturally occurring in food and is going to be more concentrated in your fruits. Also a little bit of sugar is part of your vegetables and your starchy vegetables. Next, we are going to have, oh, also we have sugar in milk. I should have you know, set up a poll to see if you guys know the name of the sugar in milk, but it's lactose. So lactose in milk is a sugar, okay? So that's also makes Milk be also considered food rich in carbohydrates. We have also starch that you can find that in 
different foods from the more unprocessed forms of starch coming from the whole grains, from beans, lentils, and peas, all the way to your vegetables having some starch. Or you have the more starchy vegetables, such as you can see here some in some potatoes, we have corn, which is a more starchy vegetables. And then we have the non-starchy vegetables, they also have carbohydrates, but the proportion of water in them is a lot higher. So even though they have carbohydrates, they are not very concentrated in, in them. So the vegetables you see here on the lower right corner, those are the lowest calorie dense foods. So those are the foods that you can eat more abundantly and get a lot of nutrition, very few calories. And fiber, fiber is found in unprocessed forms of carbohydrates and minimally processed forms of carbohydrates, such, such as you can see in this picture of a nice whole wheat or whole grain bread. Fiber is part of your carbohydrates that is not digestible. So fiber contributes to bulking the food in your stomach also contributes to slowing down the digestion. So it has a very important role in many features of disease prevention and helping with weight management as well. So what are the functions of carbohydrates in the body? So I like to compare it to a car, you know, that for the engine to work, you need to put gas, right? So the function of carbohydrates is mainly to provide energy for the engines of the body to work, you know, for your respiration, for your heart to beat, for your eyes to blink, for your brain to think, right? Brain depends on carbohydrates is the preferred source of energy for your brain. Also carbohydrates, when you consume a little bit more than what it is needed for that energy, the excess is stored in, in your body in the form of glycogen. So glycogen is the form of storage of carbohydrates and it's going to be stored in your muscle cells and in your liver cells. And this form of energy is going to be released in times of need. So if you're fasting um, or if you're performing extraneous physical activity and you haven't eaten enough to provide energy for the activity, then your liver and your muscle cells are going to release the extra energy stored in them. So having given this background on what are carbohydrates, what is their function, does it matter what kind of carbohydrates we eat? Are they all created equal, calorie by calorie? So let's look at these two examples here. We have this beautiful apple and we have here on the right, this more concentrated form of carbohydrates. Let me just see what my camera is doing. Okay, so if you can see on the, let me pull up the next. Okay, so this large apple gives you 126 calories. Those two little cookies also give you pretty similar amount of calories, 120. But just by looking at them, you can see that volume-wise, they are pretty different, right? But we can see more closely that this large apple weighs 242 grams, and those tiny cookies, only 25 grams. So I'm comparing here in terms of calories, but in terms of weight, we have, you know, we get a lot more volume and, and weight from the apple, right? We can see also other differences here. The apple has almost six grams of fiber versus two grams on those two tiny cookies. And if you were to adjust the serving of these cookies to have the same weight as the apple, they would come up to 1,161 calories. So those tiny cookies are 9.2 times more calorie dense than the apple. How does that happen? Typically when they process the food to turn something like this into something like this. So a lot of water is lost. So now you're concentrating the calories. Also oftentimes they're gonna add extra sugar, extra fat. So those are the type of carbohydrates that we want to be more careful with. 
versus the unprocessed forms of carbohydrates. Okay, so that's time for our first poll question. I don't know if Angie is ready to release that. Myth or fact, if you have diabetes, you should avoid eating fruit because of its sugar content. So let's have you guys vote. And it looks like most have voted. Okay. A couple more coming in. Okay, I think most everyone has voted. Okay, so let's see the results. Okay, 100% said meth. Okay, sounds like I'm preaching to the choir here, but let's look at the evidence, right? Because it always helps for you to be able to share with your friends and family why you shouldn't be afraid of eating fruit, even if you have diabetes. Okay, so this is a myth because I am right. Everybody got the answer correct. Okay, so let's look at some of the studies and then I'm gonna share a patient of mine, his testimony. So one of the studies I wanna share is a study that was conducted in China and they follow half a million adults, aged 30 to 79 for seven years. And they look at their fruit consumption. So they found that the participants without diabetes at the beginning of the study, those who had higher fruit consumption, it was associated with significantly lower risk of developing diabetes. So from the group that was eating more fruit, they had much less cases of diabetes in the future. The group on the study that already started off with diabetes at baseline, the more fruit they ate was associated with lower risk of all cause mortality and less microvascular and macrovascular complications. So even those with diabetes, they benefited from eating more fruits because of all the antioxidants, anti-inflammatory components in fruit. So here, here's the reference for the study if any of you want to look at the, the article. The next study was a review of 10 other studies, prospective studies, and they followed over 434,000 participants over time. And they found that the higher fruit or green leafy vegetables consumption was associated with a significant reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. So we have a lot of studies coming up that are showing the amazing benefits of fruit. And I have to say, even though I've been a dietitian for almost 16 years, I did not learn much of this benefit in school. So there are a lot of recent science that is showing all these amazing benefits. So I started to share this with my, with my patients because I work a lot with patients with diabetes. So this is the testimony of one of my patients, a 50 year old male. So he chose to put this to the test. So th he decided to replace his usual, usual choice of breakfast, which was fast food based before, and he replaced that with fruits. So in three months, he lost 12 pounds and his A1C went from 9.9 to 6.9. So A1C is a measurement of the blood sugar control over three, a period of three months and anything above seven, is considered uncontrolled. So he was able to control his diabetes just by eating more fruits. So that's an amazing feature of this carbohydrate rich food. Also in terms of weight loss, as you can see this, this case that I shared with you guys, he lost 12 pounds in three months. So there is also some science showing that fruit has a lot of anti-obesity mechanisms in them. I'm not gonna discuss them in too much details, but what the studies find is that people that tend to eat more fruit, they tend to be more lean, okay? So it helps with satiety, it helps even to regulate the type of bacteria you have in your gut that are going to crave certain foods. So there are a lot of things that we are unfolding that 
con contributes to our understanding on how beneficial fruit is to our health. All right, so now we're gonna have the next question, the next poll question, myth or fact? If you're trying to lose weight, you should avoid starchy foods such as bread, potatoes, and pasta, and try to eat a more low-carb diet. So let's see what you guys think on that one. We still got some votes coming in. Okay. And this one's going to be fun. Looks like we're ready to share the results here. Oh, we still got a couple votes coming in. All right, let's share the results. Okay, wow. So this was a lot different the first one. So we have 41% of you saying that is true that you should avoid eating starchy foods such as bread, potatoes, and pasta and move towards a more low carb diet. So yeah, that should be interesting. So let's see what the science says about that. So that is actually a myth and I'm going to explain myself. Okay. So first of all, you cannot just look at those foods isolated, right? Because very few people are going to eat bread by itself. Usually when they eat bread, they're going to put something on that bread, right? So we cannot just blame bread. You also need to look at what kind of bread are we talking about? Is it a white bread or is it a 100% whole wheat or whole grain? We also can look at the example of the potato. Very few people are going to eat the potato just boil without putting anything on it, right? So you also need to look at what form of starch, how are you preparing that starch, and what are you eating that with? So those are all considerations when it comes to weight loss. And it is true that there are some diets out there that promote a lot of weight loss being low carb. And it is a fact that part of it is a fact, but it's also a fact that you can lose significant amount of weight eating an abundant amount of foods that have starch in them as long as they are, they are unprocessed or minimally processed, and as long as the whole meal is also with all the unprocessed foods and low in fat, because as we shared before, fat is the one macronutrient that is the highest in calories. So let's look at some science to talk about that. So there are actually some studies looking at the comparison between low carb diets, such as the ketogenic diet versus high carb diets, as long as those carbohydrates be coming from whole food, plant-based. That's what those, those acronyms stands for, the WSTB, so whole food, plant-based. So one of those studies was a review of 13 studies that lasted longer than a year. And the ketogenic diet was associated with less than one kilogram of additional weight loss when compared to a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. Okay, so 13 studies lasting longer than a year. And that's one of the features of those low carb diets. They can be effective, but they are very hard to sustain over time. So most people get off those diets in about a year. So you don't want a plan that is not sustainable, right? The other study was a review of 32 controlled feeding studies. So they actually gave people the food so there was less room for errors in reporting what they are eating because they were fed the food to compare. And they found that the energy expenditure and fat loss were greater with low fat diets compared with ketogenic diets. So we actually increase your metabolism to lose more fat if you're eating low fat, which to me makes total sense. But there's a lot of people embracing the ketogenic, the ketogenic diet just because it gives, it gives quick results. But long term, there is a lot of potential problems that they can face. We can discuss this in more details in a future presentation. So ketogenic diets also lack studies on long-term safety. 
This will be nice. Hopefully he finds good pitches for me. Okay. Yeah, so those diets, those ketogenic diets don't have long-term safety that we can even embrace them or recommend them. And the observational studies suggest that they increase all-cause mortality. And the last bullet point, there was a review on long-term studies comparing the ketogenic, ketogenic diet with low-fat diets for weight loss and reported also no difference in glycemic control or blood sugar control among persons with type 2 diabetes. So I hope this is sufficient to show you that you can eat a high, healthy carbohydrates, low fat diet and achieve, if, if not the same, but even superior results as the ketogenic diet being more sustainable and with more health benefits as, as we're gonna share. So what would be the benefits of eating healthy carbohydrate rich foods? So it slows down the emptying of the stomach. So it makes you feel full sooner. That's what we describe as satiation. And you stay full longer. That's the term for satiety. And therefore it helps with weight management. So the amount of food you eat that is high in fiber is gonna stay a lot longer in your stomach. It's gonna be a slow digestion process. And so therefore you're not gonna feel hungry as much in between meals. Also, this type of diet has been shown to help to lower your total cholesterol and your LDL cholesterol. Helps to reduce the risk of heart disease, type two diabetes, hypertension, certain types of cancer and obesity. And that can be found in this, one of these references here, the position of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics on vegetarian diets. You can find all this information there. And there was a series of systematic reviews published in the Lancet, which is a very prestigious scientific journal. And this review included observational studies and clinical trials. And included study con studies conducted over nearly 40 years. And they concluded that people who eat high levels of dietary fiber and whole grains have lower rates of chronic diseases compared with people who eat lesser amounts. So all of this con contributes also to increase longevity. So you guys may have heard of the blue zones. It's, so those are areas in the world where people live longer. They tend to have more sentient areas. There are other areas. And one of the things they observe is that those cultures, they tend to eat a high fiber or a plant-based diet. So before we switch gear to discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly, quote unquote, carbohydrates. So I found this interesting Bible verse in the book of Isaiah 55 and verse, verse two, where it says, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. So, God wants us to have an abundant life. And there are some foods that are gonna be good in taste. That's why he included the word here, the life, but also good for our bodies in terms of health benefits. And that's what I intended to, when I, you know, when I put this definition here of good carbs. So those are foods that are tasty, but also they contribute to your health and longevity. So the good carbs are defined as those, uh, the more unprocessed forms of food, foods that are rich in carbohydrates. Mind you, I don't like to call foods just carbohydrates per se, because most of them come with other nutrients as well. So if you look at beans, lentils, or peas, they are packed with carbohydrates, but they're also packed with a lot of protein. So it's very hard to call some foods isolated carbs or protein or fat because most of them have a combination of those macronutrients with few exceptions. Be beautiful grass with tassels on the top. Okay, so we have here whole grains and we have a list of whole grains. We have, I'm not gonna read on one by one because you know, for the sake of time, but any unprocessed whole grains 
we have a lot of gluten-free options. So if somebody is sensitive to gluten, I listed here all the gluten-free options that are whole grains. We have legumes, which includes beans, lentils, peas, soybeans, and chickpeas. And we have fruits. And ideally we should be consuming them fresh, frozen, or dried instead of fruit juices. You know, again, we, with exceptions, but you get more benefits, especially for weight loss and blood sugar management if you eat the, the whole fruit versus the juice. And vegetables, both non-starchy and starchy vegetables have amazing health benefits. Maybe one day we can take more time to try to debunk some myths related to potatoes as they are sure to have a lot of health benefits as well, especially and in including weight loss, okay? As I said before, it all has to do on how you prepare these foods and what are you topping them or pairing them with. The bad carbs, I would define them as the ones that are more refined grains or those that have added sugars, okay? But we have a, a third category, which are the quote unquote ugly carbohydrates. So how do we differentiate that? So here you can see we have more refined grains. And let's look at the difference when you have a whole grain from when you refine the grain. So the whole grain has three parts. We have the interior part, which is the endosperm that concentrates the starch. We have the germ that concentrates the vitamins and minerals. And we have the outer layer, which is the bran, which concentrates more of the fiber. When they take a whole grain and it turn into a refined grain, such as a grain of brown rice to turn into this white rice you see right here, they remove the bran and the germ. So now you're left with just something that is pretty much pure starch or highly concentrated in starch without, without much nutrition left because the germ, which concentrated the vitamins and minerals in the grain, was removed in the refinement of this grain. Also, you're left with close to zero or very little fiber because the bran was removed in this process as well. So these foods pictured in the pictures here, you know, the white rice, the white bread, the white pasta, if you eat them chronically, so that's, that's a very important distinction. If you eat this every day, if that's part of your habits, they can increase the decline in cogn cognitive function, especially if you have those habits starting earlier in, in life, including your prenatal life. So it can have a very negative impact in your cogn cognitive function. It's been shown by research to increase depression and anxiety, increases the risk for obesity and type two diabetes, okay? But let's say you're invited to somebody's house once a week, you know, and they put a bowl of rice, white rice among with other foods, I don't think it would be a problem if you accept to eat that because it's something that is more occasional. So we are talking about here avoiding doing this most of the time. Also, these foods are shown to increase mortality from inflammatory diseases. And to find the reference for this, this claims here, you would have to go to the article that Andrew is gonna post on the website that has a list of all the scientific references for you. Ugly carbohydrates, I define them as ugly because they are what we call ultra processed foods. So how do we differentiate the previous category from this category here? So on this category, besides the refined grains and the other sugars, you start, when you read the labels, you start to see some ingredients that you wouldn't buy to use in your house, or you wouldn't even find those ingredients easily. Okay, so in terms of sugar, when it comes to those ultra processed foods, that's when you're going to start seeing a lot of foods with high fructose corn syrup. That's also when you're going to start to see foods that have a lot of added fats to them, especially saturated fats or trans fats. 
Those are foods also that are going to be very high in salt because those are also used as, you know, salt and sugar can be used in those foods as preservatives. And then there's a lot of names that you can read on the labels that you may not recognize. And they may be used as bulking agents. They may use, be used as anti-foaming. They may be used for carbonation, such as in the case of sodas, emulsifiers, such as in the case let's say of mayonnaise so the fat doesn't separate. So you have a lot of, a lot of ingredients that the food, and food industry can, can use that we you, knew, you wouldn't even know how to use at home. We knew, wouldn't even recognize them in the label. So that's what I classify as ultra processed foods. And you can see them in the picture here. And let's see what they, have been linked to. So these eating these foods again chronically has been linked to increased risk for asthma and cardiometabolic risk in children and has been linked to overweight or obesity, type 2 diabetes, cancer, gastrointestinal disorders, depression, frailty, cardiometabolic risk, and cardiovascular disease in adults. Okay. So when it comes to these foods, the less we eat of them, the better. And one thing that I highly encourage us to do is to look at the ones we enjoy from this picture here and try to make them a healthier version, okay? And that's also the point of having this joy of eating club because we want to maintain the pleasure of eating but make things as nutritious as possible. So we can definitely, you know, continue to share how we can make a healthier version of ice cream, how we can make a healthier version of french fries, right? So we have, we can still enjoy flavors that are similar, not quite equal the, of those flavors of these highly processed foods, but we can definitely make them better. Um, in terms of milk, since we discussed that milk is also a carbohydrate, some people may be concerned, is milk an essential food? I would say it depends. Um, in general, neither cow's milk nor plant-based milk substitutes are essential for good health, but it depends on someone's life circumstance, whether this food should be included in the diet or not. We do have a warning in, um, our, in the book, Councils of Diets and Foods, which is some literature that 70 Adventist Church use as part of a health message. So we have a warning that number one, let diet reform be progressive. And let the people taught, be taught how to prepare food without the use of milk or, or butter. Tell them that the time will soon come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter, because disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. So she said that the time is near because of the iniquity of the fallen race. The whole animal creation will groan under the diseases that curse our earth. And I don't know about you, but I see a clear picture when it comes to the pandemic we are living in that started in animals. So this was written in 1902, and she said that the time would soon to come. So we are over 100 years after this, this council. So in my house, we choose not to, to consume cow's milk anymore. And we, we make use of plant-based milk substitutes. Another consideration besides this warning of disease multiplying in animal kingdoms is that cow's milk has a lot of sugar in the form of lactose, as we discussed before, is also high in saturated fat. So it's been linked to the increase of certain conditions, which in the future we can discuss. So if a plant's milk substitute, a plant-based milk substitute is consumed, try to select unsweetened and low saturated fat options, such as unsweetened soy milk, unsweetened almond milk, and unsweetened cashew milk. And I'm just sharing here the brand that we prefer to use here at home because they don't have any preservatives or bulking agents like we were sharing in the previous slide. But if you don't have Trader Joe's where you live, try to find the one with the, you know, shorter list of ingredients that should be usually the ones with less preservatives. Um, I see that my time is running pretty fast, so I'm gonna try to not spend too much time in this next slide because this is a slide that I can bring back 
with other topics. But just when you're reading labels, it's very helpful to identify the daily values. So I'm just going to share quick some quick tips here. When you look at this column here with the daily value in percentage, anything you're trying to minimize or eat a low, look for 5% or less. Anything you're trying to eat more, look for 10% or more. And anything with 20% or more is what we consider very high salt. In terms of processed foods, try to aim for a ratio of five to one on your, on your total carbohydrates to the dietary fiber. So you can look at your total carbs and divide by five. So the number you get, that's how much fiber should be minimum. And trying to get, if you eat any foods that are processed or minimally processed, try to get, look for the ones that would be low in saturated fat, low in added sugars and low in sodium, especially if you suffer from high blood pressure. In terms of dietary fiber, men should aim to get at least 38, 38 grams per day and women should get at least 25 grams per day. And if you move towards eating more of those um, processed plant foods, you don't need to worry about calculating those grams of fibers. They'll come very naturally. In terms of added sugar, we should definitely minimize and try to give preference for the sugar in fruit. But if you're going to consume anything that has added sugar, it is suggested by the American Heart Association that men should limit their added sugars to 36 grams per day. And that would be equivalent to 90 spoons in terms of other sugars or concentrated sugars that you have in your house, like honey. And women should limit to 20, 24 grams per day. And that would be equivalent to six teaspoons. You can also look at the ingredients list and you can find a lot of interesting information. So if you see, um, first of all, when you look at the ingredients list, the ingredients are listed in descending order by weight. So the ones that come first is the one that is more prevalent in that particular product, right? Also, if sugar is listed as first or second ingredient, or if different types of sugars are listed, you can know for sure that product is high sugar. Right. So even though this product here lists on the front that is oats and honey, honey comes way down here before sugar. So if they were really truthful, they should be say, oh, they should say oats and sugar rather than oats and honey. But most likely people would not be too attracted to buy something that says oats and sugar. So they trick you to think the other ingredient is more prevalent. So that's why it's so helpful to read labels because you can kind of find those hidden secrets that the food industry is trying to disguise in their products. You can also see in this example here that there are three types of sugar. We have sugar, we have honey, and then we have brown sugar syrup, which is very common for the food industry to also use multiple types of sugar. Um, they try to make their recipes as tasty as possible, but also as profitable as possible. So sometimes they use those combinations. And we had a question last month that was left unanswered. And I'm gonna use this example here to answer that question. As you can see, one of the ingredients listed here, the last ingredient is listed as natural flavor. And I'm very glad that question was posed last month because I had never looked into that. I've always thought, oh, natural flavor must be natural. But I learned with my investigation that it's not quite natural as I thought. So I'm just gonna quickly explain without reading this long definition here, but basically according to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which is the organ that regulates those foods and food labeling system, anything that is termed natural flavor is a type of flavoring extracted from any type of food, which can be a spice, it can be a fruit, vegetable. Also, it can be parts of the plant or parts of animals. So I don't even know if this granola bar has a part of animal coming from the natural flavor in it or not, because the flavor manufacturers, according to the regulations, don't need to disclose the ingredients that they come that they come up with to make those flavors. I didn't even know, mind you, that there was such a thing as a flavor 
manufacturing industry. So these are industries that are exclusively investing in science to extract flavor from different types of food, whether it's natural or artificial. So when you see natural flavor, you don't know, you know, how did they get to that flavor because they can use solvents, they can use emulsifiers, they can use whatever technique they don't need to disclose and they don't even need to disclose whether the natural flavor is from a plant source or from an animal source, if that's one of your concerns. So some of the take home points, make peace with healthy carbohydrate rich foods. Um, in complete peace with those, that's what we eat here at home, an abundance amount of those foods. Try to fill at least half of your plate at each meal with fruits and then start with vegetables or a com or combination of both, because those are the foods that concentrate more vitamins and minerals. Aim to eat all of your grains and grain-based products from whole grain options as much as you can. And try to prepare your own meals as much as possible versus depending on ready to eat meals. Aim to eat at least one cup of cooked beans, lentils, or peas every day. And try to make your plate colorful by varying the types of foods from each of those food groups we discussed. And definitely enjoy the process because those are foods that God designed for us to taste very good too, which I'm hoping to convince you to make this recipe that I'm going to be showing after the breakout sessions. It's a vibrant Mexican quinoa that meets all the criteria of rich, healthy carbohydrate foods. And it's a colorful dish, very tasty. And we're going to be featuring these ingredients listed here. The, the recipe should be uploaded on the website today. And in terms of a, a homework, a resource for you to look at home, I mean, what I would like to highlight today is this website called nutritionfacts.org, which is a website that is wonderful. It's a wonderful source of information. You can just type in the search box, whatever disease, whatever food that you're curious about, and there's a lot of information put together. I would encourage you to, if you're interested in learning more of the benefits of eating this way for those who have diabetes, you can either use this link here or you can just type in the search box benefits of a microbiotic diet for diabetes, which is a diet high in those unprocessed carbohydrates. And you can search other things on this website as well. And last but not least, let's keep in mind that the original diet that God intended you know, for humans and for animals. In, in Genesis 1 29 says that he and said, God, God said, behold, I have given you every herb yielding seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you, it shall be for food. So the original diet, which is also gonna be the diet we're all gonna have in heaven is going to be very rich in carbohydrates, but the good for your health carbohydrates. So I hope this gives you some peace and helps you to go back to eat an abundant amount of those healthy foods.